Thank you, Stephen. Yes, we've been friends for many years. I guess it follows from your last remark that if you have heard me before, you're not in for a treat. So. <laughs> uh, okay, so I want to talk about the phenomenal access consciousness distinction. Uh, it grew out of a paper by Ned Block way back in 1995 in Behavioral and Brain Sciences when uh, uh, Stephen was editor of it. And so it's been around for the better part of 20 years. And many people adopt it or they think they're adopting it. It's got quite a, a robust presence in the field in spite of my best efforts. Um, so what is the distinction between access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness? Well, access consciousness is the phenomenon where information gets into functional position to be noticed, reasoned about, reported by a subject. So it's access to that subject. In my terms, uh, whatever heterophenomenology is about, since you gather your heterophenomenological data from uh, uh, communicative interactions with the subject, that's, all of that is, as it were, by definition, uh, has access consciousness for your subject, whether your subject is a zombie or, or not. Now, what about phenomenal consciousness? Phenomenal consciousness is um, not access consciousness and involves um, phenomenality. Oh, okay, what's that? I actually went searching in the last 24 hours through various papers by various people, looking on Wikipedia, looking at Ned's I, I can't find anywhere, anything that even purports to be a succinct and accurate definition of phenomenality. So I don't feel particularly abashed when I say, I'm really not sure what phenomenality is supposed to be, which puts me in an awkward position. I'm going to try to extract myself from that position by probing around here and there in a rather informal way. I completely revised this talk last night, and uh, we'll just see where it goes. Uh, one of the things about the distinction is that Bloch, wisely or not, has, been, uh, in, uh, has decided that he should say that there can be access consciousness without phenomenal consciousness, and there can be phenomenal consciousness without access consciousness. So he wants to say there's a sort of double dissociation here, uh, and uh, let's see what that might be. Another thing is that um, access consciousness is easy by general acclaim in the, in the Chalmers sense. These are the problems that we've got a pretty good handle on. And uh, uh, phenomenal consciousness is capital H hard. Uh, some people don't agree with that, but that sort of anchors the discussion for many people. Um, I'm already, I have questions that I do not know the answer to, and let me, let me start, I, I, I have to preface this by saying there's a move that philosophers make that I detest. They listen to you and then they look at you and they say, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't understand what you're saying, which is code for it's nonsense. And my reaction to that in the recent past has been very often to look him right in the eye and say, yes, I know these are really hard problems. Try harder. <laughs> so I really don't want myself to pull the I don't understand move on Ned. But it has to start there because I, this, is, this is not false modesty and I'm not trying to pass the buck. I really am somewhat baffled by what 
he means by phenomenality. For instance, isn't phenomenality a kind of access consciousness? Isn't phenomenal consciousness? Does it involve um, uh, access of some sort? Uh, perusing through some of Bloch's writings on this, I found the following sentence. There is a me-ness, a me-ness to phenomenal consciousness. Sounds like access to the subject to me, but apparently it isn't. So this is something that we have to try to get clear about. Isn't this a way of saying that P consciousness requires my access to the phenomenal properties? Well, if so, then this must be a different sort of access. Now, back 10, 15 years ago, I, uh, I wrote a number of papers where I challenged the uh, distinction, said it's just broken back, it doesn't work. These are a couple of them. And uh, I figured that was enough. And so I dropped it for uh, more than a decade. And I guess that was a tactical error because Bloch didn't drop it. And my silence has been interpreted in many quarters as concession. I now agree that there's a perfectly good distinction between phenomenal access consciousness. No, I'm sorry, I don't. I just got tired of talking about it. And so now I'm back in the fray. I'm going to try one more time to see if I can uh, get clear about it and, and pr to present my misgivings. And then if I'm wrong, maybe somebody here will be able to show me what's right. I'm not alone. I have a brilliant student who, who uh, cajoled me into working on this one more time. And we uh, did a paper, uh, appeared in Tix last year, called Consciousness Cannot Be Separated from Function. Michael Cohen is the, is the lead author, and I'm the second author. And uh, uh, I owe a lot to Michael for the way I'm now thinking about this. Um, uh, he started as a philosopher, now he's a heavy-duty experimental psychologist working at Harvard with um, Ken Nakayama and George Alvarez and uh, uh, doing some really good work. He, by the way, uh, is in Brighton at the ASSC meeting, and on Wednesday he's giving a talk, which will be the empirical nuts and bolts of, of the position that we hold. Uh, it's called a multi-access model of consciousness and as multi-access suggests, the very question that I was raising a minute ago, uh, doesn't phenomenal consciousness itself involve a kind of access? To which our answer is, yeah, of course. It wouldn't be consciousness if it didn't. Because Bloch is right. There is a meanness to consciousness wherever it appears. But what I'm going to do today, uh, instead of uh, trying to anticipate what Michael's going to do in Brighton or to do my own version of that, is I'm going to be more of a philosopher and I'm going to try for a sort of new bird's eye view of the whole issue. Go back to, right, go back to square one and see what we can make of it. So what is phenomenal consciousness supposed to be? Why does it seem to some people at least to be a good idea? And is the idea of phenomenal consciousness without access consciousness coherent? And I'm going to try to introduce this, or I might say anchor this, with uh, a, an example, a putative example of phenomenal consciousness. Now I'm going to begin with a Canadian flag. I was going to do uh, a uh, complementary colors after image on this, but I try as I might, I couldn't figure out how to get that white part black. So I gave up on that, and I retreated to my old example. And so, well, it's almost the 4th of July anyway, and now I've shown the Canadian flag first, and that's, that's flag etiquette after all. So now we can proceed with, with this example. And I want everybody here to have in their own personal consciousness, in their immediate experience, an example of what we're going to be talking about. So I beg you to simply indulge me with this little experiment. Uh, as you might guess, I want you to uh, stare at the uh, white cross and not let your eyes roam. Just fixate the white cross for a few more seconds and go. Did it work? OK, did everybody get that? OK. 
not rocket science, it's a very familiar idea. Would you agree, if I'd asked you while, the, while that was on, would you have said, I am having a flag after image? Well, yeah, yeah. the stripes and stars are, are, are quite blurry. Yeah. Here's a tough one. The lowest short red stripe, the lowest short red stripe, is intersecting the black cross. Just so you, I want you to keep that sentence in mind because I'm going to give you another chance. Okay, so here we go again. So don't let your eyes wander. Don't let your eyes wander. A few more seconds. That should be plenty of time. Okay? Now, the lower short red stripe is intersecting the black cross. How many say yeah? Okay, good. So that's the phenomenon I want us to concentrate on right there. So you would agree with this statement. Now, what are you talking about? Something real, something red, or so it seems, right? Where is it? It's not on the screen. It's not on your retina. Is it in your brain? No. Besides, if there was a red stripe in your brain, it's dark in there anyway. It wouldn't do any good. No. Now this gives rise to a host of philosophical problems, as I'm sure you already know. Uh, they all really center around Leibniz's law of identity, which is one of the few trivial philosophical or logical claims, which is simply that if A is identical to B, then whatever is true of A is true about B and vice versa. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, et cetera, et cetera. But what follows from this uncontroversial principle is this. If A is a red stripe and nothing in the brain is a red stripe, actually, of course, I suppose there are red stripes in the striate cortex if you look hard enough, but that's not the point, is it? then nothing in the brain is identical to A, which has to be somewhere else. Dualism follows. By, in my opinion, this is the shortest, sweetest, and actually in the end the most convincing argument for dualism I know. And as a good materialist, I have to resist this. So I encourage you all to resist this. Somehow, we've got to avoid this conclusion. And yet, we also have to acknowledge that red stripe. How are we going to do it? Dualism follows unless we materialists bite the bullet. So how do you bite the bullet here? You say this. You are experiencing a red stripe. But there is no red stripe that you are experiencing. That gets us off the hook. It only seems to you that there is a red stripe that you are experiencing. You really are experiencing a red stripe, but it only seems to you that there is a red stripe that you are experiencing. Well, how are we going to make sense of that? Well, maybe W.V.O. Quine can come to the rescue. He talked about related problems, and he talked about what he called fusion. So Quine's recommendation is that we treat that sentence, you are experiencing a red stripe, as fused. You are experiencing a red stripe. That's one big lumpy predicate. It's got no parts so that you can't quantify into it and so forth. Well, it solves or evades a logical problem. If what you're interested in is cleaning up your sentences for logical notation, that'll do a pretty good job. And it's not as if there aren't cases where we really do that with language. Think about kicking the bucket. Which bucket? No, 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 I didn't really commit myself to the existence of a bucket. Kick the bucket is just an idiom. How about catching a crab. That's one that actually fooled me as a youth. If you row, if you're in crew, when, if you catch the oar in the water wrong and it 
digs in and it hits you, the, it hits you in the ribs and might even knock you out of the boat. That's called catching a crab. There's no crab that you catch. That's what it's called. Just an idiom. Those are idioms that are quinianly fused. Well, we could do that, I suppose, with experiencing a red stripe and a few gazillion variations on it and just say those are large, lumpy, unanalyzable predicates, which can be true on occasion, but do not have the import that they would otherwise be taken to have. All right. In other words, we could grind the red stripe. It's a, not a very satisfying option, but it's available. To quine is to deny the existence of something real and important. Uh, it was in my lexicon, and uh, let me indulge myself just a bit, tell you my favorite example of coining. It comes in a movie, which some of you may remember, uh, called Jumbo, not Dumbo, but Jumbo, starring Doris Day, Jimmy Durante and a very large elephant. And it falls to Jimmy Durante to uh, steal the elephant back from the evil circus. And he is seen tiptoeing through the shadows at the circus with this giant hawser, this great rope over his shoulder with the elephant in tow. And he's tiptoeing along. And a policeman comes out of the shadows and says, Halt! Where are you going with that elephant? And Durante does this great double takes this. What elephant? That's coining. <laughs> so you can coin the red stripe if you dare. What red stripe? And in a way, in the end, as you see, I'm going to do that. But I'm going to try to find a more persuasive way of doing that. In fact, we have to do that if we're going to be materialists. Well, Quine to the rescue. How about Brentano to the rescue? The red stripe in Brentano speak is an intentional object which doesn't have to exist. In this regard, it's like Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes lived on Baker Street through sentence, but Sherlock Holmes didn't exist. It's the fictional character. Ponce de Leon was searching for the fountain of youth, but the fountain of youth didn't exist. Very important when you think about intentional objects to recognize that intentional objects are not ideas. Let me say that again. Intentional objects are not ideas. Ponce de Leon was not searching for an idea. He had the idea in his head. He was searching for the fountain of youth. The thing he was searching for was deemed to be something outside, not something in his mind. So the, the concept of intentional objects was a tricky concept. So one might say that the red stripe, like the fountain of youth, has intentional inexistence, to use Brentano's term. And as you'll see, I'm going to be supporting a version of that, trying to make that seem more plausible. Now, the example of complementary color images was uh, nothing new about that. They've been understood for many years. Um, well, the causation of complementary afterimages is well understood. Their metaphysical status, I think, is, is still unsettled. We know a lot about how to make complementary color afterimages, but what we've made when we may make one is uh, people sort of cough and turn away and pretend you didn't ask them that question. So, but we're going to have to address it. That's, we really do have to address it. And it's been used as a philosophical example at least since 1963 when J.J.C. Smart in his classic introductory materialism paper, Sensations and Brain Processes, used the example. His was of an orange after image. But here's what he said after treating this as a challenge, pretty much the very challenge that I've just presented to you. He said, here's how we should paraphrase what somebody says who says they, they are seeing a, an afterimage red stripe. Here's his formula. What is going on in me is like what goes on in me when I see a red stripe. It's wonderfully non-committal and, in his terms, topic neutral. That is where the term topic neutral comes from. It's neutral between materialism, uh, dualism, whatever. It's just all I know is something's happening in me, which is very much like what happens in me when I 
when there's a red stripe in the world that I actually see. That's his paraphrase. It's as if you're saying, well, I'd swear I was seeing a red, real red stripe if I didn't know better. That's how much it is like seeing a red stripe. But in what the likeness consists, he says, we, we draw a blank. We have no introspective access into what it is that causes us to have this conviction that what is going on in us is like what would be going on if there really was a red stripe. We don't have any privileged access to that. I think that's basically right. Let's just look at the where we stand now. We can talk about that red stripe. I deliberately chose the example so that we can see that we have no trouble referring to that red stripe. The one, which one? The lowest one, the one that's intersecting the, the black cross. It's a thing for us, as good as any other thing in our experienced world. It's a part of our experience in that sense. And yet, I'm saying it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. It only seems to us that it exists. So we have to look at this seeming. How to explain this, it seems to us. In Consciousness Explained, I tackled this problem by inventing uh, a character, Otto, who was sort of my interlocutor, who, who insisted that there was something that Otto called real seeming. And real seeming involved something happening that was, you know, some, something that you, it wasn't just that you had this conviction. See, there was in addition to the conviction, there was the real seeming that was the source of the conviction. So a little dialogue. person says, there seems to be a red stripe. Yeah, but there isn't. But there seems to be one. Real seeming, in other words. Or you might say that there really seems to be a red stripe. It's not just a felt tendency to believe or say or suppose that there's a red stripe. There's something more to it. Real seeming, whatever that is. Something made of what? I had a rude suggestion. Let's call whatever it is figment. It's like pigment, only it's imaginary. So I said, the issue now becomes, is there figment? How can a materialist tolerate a brain that has a good supply of figment that it can make real seemings out of, red figment and green figment and all the rest. Of course, I was treating this as a sort of reductio ad absurdum. But I have to tell you, a number of eminent psychologists and philosophers have said to me, sort of in private, Dan, I think I believe in figment. And you know, I think a lot of people believe in figment. They don't want to admit it when they hear me ridiculing the idea, but they don't see any other way of treating those red stripes but to believe in figment. And some of you out there may think, why is he dumping on this idea? This is a good idea. Well, I don't think it is, but I can see why some of you might think it is. So, phenomenal consciousness, is it, are the items in phenomenal consciousness made of figment? This is another way of getting at my perplexity. To which the answer, I would say, surely not. I'm not, I don't want to accuse Ned Block of believing in figment. He's not one of the philosophers who said, Dan, I believe in figment. So, I'm going to set that aside. All right, maybe some people, when they think about phenomenal consciousness, they think it's made of figment which, since I haven't divined it, is just sort of a wild card. It's something pretty special, and it's nothing that, you know, you find in the grocery store or in the standard uh, list of ingredients, what goes into brains. Well, if it's not made of figment, what is it? Well, sometimes confronting a problem like this, it's very good to adopt Breitenberg's wonderful principle of the law 
of uphill analysis and downhill synthesis. In his elegant little book, Vehicles, he points out that it's easier many times to synthesize something out of parts you have control of and understand and arrive by synthesis at something much easier than taking the whole big mysterious thing and trying to analyze it into its parts. Reverse engineer it as it were top down. If you're going to do reverse engineering, actually what you should do is sort of forward engineering and then watch what you're doing as you add the parts. So I want to try to engage in an exercise in forward engineering trying to create some phenomenal consciousness where there wasn't any before. Okay? And I'm going to call on my old friend, Cog. This is Rod Brooks et al.'s humanoid robot project of some years ago, and I was very happily involved in that project for a number of years. It was, it was great fun, and we learned a lot. And as I was rummaging through some papers, I came across... Uh, an interesting historical document. I wonder if Rod would appreciate my showing it to you. This is the suspense calendar that he wrote the first year for the, for the, for the project. And you can see, I don't know if you can, oh yeah, you, you'll be able to read that pretty well. Uh, uh, you see we started with uh, peripheral motion, saccades, vestibular ocular reflex, smooth pursuit, head eye, co head -eye coordination, uh, uh, sound localization, sound motion, uh, uh, correlation. And you see way down at the bottom at the end, you get the multiple drafts, emergence. Uh, this was going to be a whole conscious robot if we ever got to the bottom and the end of that list. Well, uh, we didn't, of course. Uh, the project got, um, it, it died a natural death, not because it was failing. It was actually making some very good progress. We got, I would say, about halfway through that list. But graduate students moved on to other jobs, and Rod took an administrative position. He didn't have time to work on it, and it would have involved doing, redoing a lot of the software for various reasons. It was just time to put it in a museum, declare victory, and go on to do other things. So COG is now just history. But I want to, what, what do philosophers do? They take bits of sorted history, and then they turn them into thought experiments. So I want to take COG as it was and say, did COG have phenomenal consciousness? To which the answer is, I don't think so, and I don't think anybody here thinks so, but now we want to try to add it. So I want to add some phenomenal consciousness to COG. So how? Well, first of all, we want to make sure that the vision system was susceptible to complementary color after images. Um, it wasn't, as in fact, it did start out black and white, then it went to color. But it simply there didn't seem to be any point in building in the opponent process system that we have uh, in our visual system. It, uh, it, it finessed that step. But we could have, it could have been done. It's well enough understood, I think, uh, so, that it, so that it could have been amenable to uh, uh, the flag effect. Of course, to do it right, you'd have to either just fix its head or give it enough language so that you could say, please just fixate the, the, the cross. Don't move your eyes around. It was very good at doing saccades. Uh, uh, we'd have to instruct it to keep your gaze constant for a few seconds. And then what would happen? Well, uh, we'd build in the, uh, yeah, I've already said that, refractory period. We could, this would all be not so hard to model. And then, of course, we'd want to test COG. So we, we set up COG in front of the screen, and we show the, the black, yellow, and green flag, and uh, uh, wait a few seconds, and then we show it just the background screen, and look at COG, and COG says, I'm having a flag after him. The stripes and stars are quite blurry. The lowest short red stripe is intersecting the black cross, so we declare victory, right? Ta-da, we've done it. Except I don't think anybody here thinks that that would prove a darn thing. It would be too easy to accomplish this bit of linguistic activity without actually putting in the phenomenal consciousness, whatever it is. So I think most of you would say, oh, what a cheat. You know, that's, that just doesn't count. Why not? Well, because there's no phenomenal consciousness in COG. Well, who says? 
and why. This is what we want to get at now, because I want to add it. So I'd like to know why people are so sure that there isn't any phenomenal consciousness in cock. Is it because it's made of metal and wire and silicon rather than protein? I hope not. If, if that's what you're thinking, I think that's uh, protein chauvinism, and you should just <laughs> forget about that. Um, Here's a question. Does Cog have access consciousness? Have we got here a case that Bloch thinks is perfectly real? Cog has access, the easy kind of consciousness, access consciousness. After all, Cog talks about the afterimage. But it's just that the after, although Cog talks about the afterimage and says its edges are blurry, there's no phenomenality in its phenomenal consciousness. It doesn't have phenomenal consciousness. So let's, let's suppose that that's so. Uh, but we might agree that, that, that Cog does have at least a serviceable parallel model of access consciousness. But more, suppose we look inside. What are we going to find inside Cog? We're going to find that there's going to be a representational state caused in roughly the same way its counterpart in us is. And, and it's going to be the source and the cause of the conviction or judgment that there's a red strike. I mean, if we want to know, let me compare that with a real cheat. We don't bother messing with Cog's visual system at all. We just can a few sentences, those very sentences. And when, when Cog is put in front of this, that's what Cog says, and it's just parroted. That would be a cheat. Not unknown in AI circles in the old days, but that's not what we're doing here. I'm supposing that the reason that Cog says the red stripes are blurry is because of some feature of its visual representation at the time. So we're getting, we're getting close, I think, I think, to phenomenal consciousness. But who knows? We can get closer, I think. Okay. No protein, no figment. I'm going to set that aside. If you think that's serious, that would be a point of discussion. Somebody, like Stephen here, might say, well, there's no feeling. No. Yes, I thought I might. Stephen and I have a long history of talking about this. This is his favorite term for this. But Rod Brooks himself, uh, late in the COG project, liked to talk about this very issue. And his term was the juice. <laughs> Are we leaving out the juice? Is there no juice in COG? And if so, uh, are we completely got the wrong end of the stick, or could we add the juice somehow? And then a student of mine, um, Gabe Love, came up with a variation of that, the sauce, which is an acronym for subjective aspect unique to conscious experience. <laughs> so. We got all these different terms for the whatever it is that Cog leaves out. So in one sense, we're, we're making a little sort of nibbling progress in that we're, we're sort of triangulating what people feel dissatisfied with and why they tend to believe in phenomenal consciousness. But I don't think we have a positive account yet. We just have a bunch of names which are evocative, but you know nobody thinks it's juice or sauce or figment. Some people think it's feeling, whatever that is. Well, let's suppose that I am leaving something out, and whatever you want to call it, but for the sake of today, I am going to call it feeling in honor of our host. In fact, when Stephen sent me some proposed titles for me to consider for my talk today, he had this, two consciousnesses, feeling versus knowing, Knowing, felt versus unfelt, accessing knowledge versus experiencing knowledge, accessing experiences versus experiencing experiences, accessing data versus experiencing data. That list of titles 
gives you a good sense of where Steve's coming from on this issue. He, any one of them would be happy, uh, he'd be happy with, because he, he would be getting me to talk about the, maybe the only thing that we don't agree about anymore. We've, we've uh, hashed this out before. Okay, where do we go with this? Feelings. No, I won't sing it. <laughs> I would think, Steve will correct me if I'm wrong, must be felt. I think an unfelt feeling is probably not what you want to have in your theory, but maybe I'm wrong about that. And it seems to me they have to be felt by someone, by an organism. Maybe appreciated would be a good word. A completely unappreciated, unnoticed, unfelt feeling was, wouldn't be a feeling. Or at least I'm supposing that that might be what Steve would say. Then we can face this question, isn't appreciation obviously a kind of access? How can you appreciate something without having access to it? Which maybe is fine with Stephen, but wouldn't be fine with Ned, because he insists that there's a category of phenomenal consciousness without access at all. That's what's puzzling me to the point of, uh, that's where my spade is turned, but I'm nibbling around the edges trying to do better with it. Can phenomenal consciousness consist of feelings that are felt but aren't accessed? We could go that way, I suppose, and then we have access, and then we have feeling. And although feeling is a kind of access, it isn't the kind of access that Bloch is talking about. I considered this hypothesis early this morning as I was reading one of Ned's papers and one of mine, and I decided that this may be it, and it may be partly my fault that some of the things I said about access when I talked about heterophenomenology did seem to stress verbal reportability of a certain sort when I meant it to include a lot more. It was verbally, at least, I was allowing for a very indirect verbal report, not straightforward uh, verbal report. And maybe I misdirected Ned, and he's got in mind two kinds of access, sort of, I would say, direct verbal access and indirect verbal access. And I would still hold out that without any access, ultimately accessible by verbal access, the idea that something is conscious is on very shaky grounds. One of the people that has taken up the block distinction is Victor Lama, a cognitive neuroscientist in Amsterdam, number of papers. Now, Bloch doesn't tell us what is necessary to turn unconscious states into phenomenally conscious states. Presumably, the information on your retina is not phenomenally conscious. Not yet. It may be the source of some later phenomenal consciousness, but it's unconscious. Uh, Lama has a positive proposal, so let's look at that. It's recurrent processes, he says, that are the key. Vision begins with non-recurrent, sort of straight, fast, feed-forward processes. No phenomenal consciousness there. But as soon as you start getting recurrent loops, that's when phenomenal consciousness enters into the picture. But that's not access. Access comes only when you get global loops, reentrant loops, recurrent loops, that's when you get access consciousness. So now we actually have a, a candidate uh, model of a sort on, on, the, on the stage to consider. Now, what is it about these recurrent processes? I, two questions that occur immediately is, how does this recurrence make a big difference? How does it carry us beyond unconscious informational transmission, representation, processing, to phenomenally conscious but non-accessible or non-accessed uh, consciousness. 
I have not seen any place where that is well spelled out or even spelled out at all. Maybe I'm missing something. And again, why isn't this recurrence itself a type of access? I don't know. In any case, an effective feeling, a feeling, is believing that you felt a feeling. I take it. That's a standard effective feeling of feeling is believing that that very thing has happened. Yeah? Well, wait a minute. Can you feel and have no clue that you're feeling? For instance, if you're comatose? For instance, if you're an feeling ouch. Oh. Okay, I'll take that under advisement. Um, fair enough, but I'm not sure I know exactly what all of that means, but we'll see. Uh, because what I want to do is say, okay, let's suppose that we agree with Stephen that feeling, we've identified feeling, and feeling involves, a feeling has to be felt by the organism. And at least some organisms then have beliefs to the very effect that they're feeling those feelings. And what I want to do is just divide through by the feeling, and we've got the beliefs, and those beliefs can do a lot of work. For instance, if you believe you're in pain, you're suffering. That's, I would think, pretty clear. Now, even if the belief is false, it might be, for instance, hypnotically induced. Now, we get to my old friend, the Cartesian Theater. This is the joke picture of the Cartesian Theater, uh, done in a Life magazine many years ago. And let me just sort of uh, walk you through it. Uh, the light comes in through the lens of the eye and exposes the film, which then is developed in those little baths. There's a nice little fan there to dry the film off. I love that touch. Then it's run through the projector onto the screen where not one but two white-coated homunculi are there to appreciate it. All right, so this is clearly a, a parody. It's a joke. And everybody can see that this is a, not a theory of consciousness. This is, this is a lousy theory of consciousness. And it's not because it's film when it should be video or digital. Or, and it's not because there's two homunculi or not because they're wearing white coats. There's something really fundamentally wrong with this picture. But I want to suggest it is actually possible. And I want to see if I can, well, first of all, I want to say, you know, there just is no Cartesian theater, obviously. But is this an empirical claim? Or is it an a priori conceptual claim? And I want to say, in fact, it's both. And I want to illustrate that, I hope this works, by showing you the Cartesian. First, I want to show you that it's an empirical claim, because the Cartesian theater is perfectly coherent as a possibility. And I will show you. Look at this. You may recognize this scene from black. That is the Cartesian Theater. There's a little green homunculus in there. It's got a lot of valves to push, a lot of things to push. He's got stereo speakers, he's got screens to look at. Contest. It's okay. What are you trying to say? To prevent. To prevent struggle. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> I love that. That's a representation of the Cartesian theater. And the empirical part of my claim is when we look inside the brain, we don't find that. 
But we could. I mean, there's nothing conceptually incoherent there. And if we ever went to a planet where they had giant humanoids and wanted to pass, we might devise a giant humanoid, not teleoperated, but endo-operated uh, 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 puppet, uh, just like that. So it's not, it's not conceptually incoherent. The, but the a priori part is, if you do find that, then you've just postponed your theory of consciousness. You've got to go down a level. You've got to ask what's going on in the little green man's head. Eventually, you have to come to a level where the moral of the story applies. Um, and that's this. The work done by the homunculus in the Cartesian theater must be distributed in both space and time within the brain. And it is, and both space and time matter for telling the story because we can get what otherwise would seem to be temporal anomalies. There isn't a threshold or a bottleneck or a finish line in the brain and it's the order in which things pass that finish line that determines their subjective order, for instance. That's, that's to make, a, a, I think, a fundamental mistake. But if we agree that in the case of human beings, if not that gigantic fellow on the morgue slab, there is no Cartesian theater, then we really must abandon the familiar vision of inbound processes starting off unconscious, becoming phenomenally conscious, and then achieving access consciousness, which is, I think, the default position of people like, like Bloch and Lama and many others. I want to try to convince you that phenomenology is an effect of access, not a cause. Recently, I've been talking about strange inversions, and I'm going to show you three, um, the first two just to introduce you to the idea of a strange inversion. I'm really interested in the third one today, and this is Darwin, Turing, and Hume. Darwin's strange inversion comes out in this wonderful passage by Mackenzie, uh, I'll just read the part that's in caps. In order to make a perfect and beautiful machine, it's not requisite to know how to make it. And he says, this expresses Darwin's view, who by a strange inversion of reasoning, that's where I got the phrase, seems to think absolute ignorance, I like the capital letters there, uh, fully qualified to take the place of absolute wisdom in all the achievement of creative skill. Good, he's got Darwin right. That is a strange inversion, and it's hard for many people to accept, but it's pretty well established now. But it is counterintuitive. Now here's Alan Turing's strange inversion of reasoning. Here are some pre-Turing computers. They're wearing dresses. They were people. They had to know what they were doing. This was a fairly demanding technical job. In the old days, computers had to understand arithmetic had to appreciate the reasons. And Turing realized this wasn't so. So there's the Darwin phrase that I just showed you. Let's revise it for Turing. In order to be a perfect and beautiful computing machine, it is not requisite to know what arithmetic is. That's Turing's strange inversion, just as unsettling to many people, and for a very similar reason in both cases. What we have is a principle which is a strange, itself a strange inversion of reasoning, competence without comprehension. The competence of natural selection, which comprehends nothing, to create all the wonderful things in the biosphere, and the competence of computers, robots, and so forth, uh, 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 the competence that at the outset requires no comprehension at all, but is simply machinery at work. On this view, understanding is an effect, not a cause. It's a recent effect of lots of competence rather than the source of competence. This is really unsettling to many people. But now let's look at Hume's inversion, which is the main point I want to talk about. And that concerns his wonderful account of causation. I'll just give you the bare bones to remind you. He said, this is what is actually given to us in experience we see A's followed by B's. 
A and then B, A and then B, in what he called constant conjunction. And he says, this experience causes a feeling of expectation in us. What he's doing basically is inventing Pavlovian conditioning long before Pavlov. And then he says, we misinterpret this as an impression of causation caused by a perceptible property of the external world. We think we're seeing and judging causation because we are caused by a property that we see out there in the world. We're seeing causation the same way you can see something that's square or red. So what he's doing is he's taking judgment and phenomenology and turning them inside out. He's saying the phenomenology, the phenomenal experience of, cause, of seeing causation is caused by an internal judgment of expectation, not the other way around. So just to schematize it, this is what we're given by the outside world, A and then B, A and then B, A and then B. This causes us to perceive a causing B, a causing B, a causing B. And this arrow that we think we see out there in the world, the arrow of causation, is in fact misattributed by us. We project it out and attach it to the objects. We seem to see causation right before our, right before our eyes, not behind our eyes. This, as Hume, is a benign illusion. So this is Hume's strange inversion. He has a famous phrase where he describes this. He talks about the mind's great propensity to spread itself on external objects. OK, lovely phrase, but what does it mean? Before we get to what it means, I want you to consider some other examples of Hume's inversion, which are more directly relevant to what we're talking about here. Here's a strange inversion. It's not the case that we like honey because it's sweet. It's more that honey is sweet because we like it. Well, that's a little too crude, but let me, let me put it slightly differently. Here's, the, here's an idea. First there was sweetness, and then we evolved to like sweetness. Nope. Nope, that's just wrong. Sweetness didn't exist before there were sweetness likers. Sweetness was born with the evolved wiring. You'd be making a terrible mistake if you went out in the world. Hello. Please. Oh, there we are. If you went out and looked at the structure of glucose very carefully trying to find the sweetness, that's hopeless. You're not going to find it. You won't find sweetness out there. If you want to understand the phenomenon of sweetness, you've got to look in the brain, and you've got to look at evolution to understand the very existence of sweetness. Just to rub home, rub this point in a little bit, I'm going to give you the pre-Humean theory of sweetness, or the pre-Darwinian theory of sweetness. Well, God saw that we should adore glucose because it's high in energy. So he sprays glucose with the uh, sweetness fog, which causes people to experience sweetness, which causes them to decide they love those sweet things with all the glucose in them. And that's how God made sugar sweet. Wrong. One cause too many. God just cut to the chase. He simply arranged for glucose to trigger the label desire, the yummy sweetness label desire, and that took over, which was wired up to the initiate, provoke, and intensify getting behavior. And as Hume said with regard to causation, we project the experience of sweetness back out into the world, a benign user illusion. These illusions are very powerful. I'm going to give you another one. We know what sexy is for. It rewards us for the time and effort spent mating. That's why it evolved. But there's nothing intrinsically sexy about this. I know some of you are inclined to disagree, but you're wrong. There's nothing intrinsically sexy about this. If there were, evolution would have a real problem. How to get chimps to mate. Well, one idea would be hallucination. 
But <laughs> you don't need that. Just wire up the chimps. What is it on the hair trigger? Just wire up chimps to love that look. That's, there's nothing intrinsically sexy about either the one that we like or the one that they like. It's just the way, it's the liking that, that flavors our perception. We adore babies because they're cute. No, that's just about backwards. We, because we find them cute, we want to cuddle them and care for them. No, we want to cuddle and care for them. And our wanting to do that is what is the source of our seeing them as cute. So there's the three inversions. And they all mistake effects for causes. And that itself is a bit puzzling. How and why did we get it so wrong? And here I want to appeal to one of my, I mean, these are all my heroes, Darwin, Turing, Hume, and one more, Wilfred Sellers, who back in 1962 in a famous paper introduced the distinction between the manifest and scientific image. The manifest image is the world we live in. It's the world of tables and chairs and cute and sweet and sexy and songs and uh, colors and the like. And the scientific image is the world of proteins and molecules and quarks and strings and so forth. And the philosopher's job, and I think he was really right about this, is to negotiate travel between these two images. And it doesn't go easily. There's no simple way of putting the manifest image in registration with the scientific image. The, the, the last few hundred years are full of cases of failed attempts at straightforward reduction or elimination. Uh, it's, a, it's a trickier matter than that. I like the idea of the manifest image, but Sellers didn't really develop sort of why it exists and how it exists. But I think here we want to look at another hero of a sort of mine, and that's J.J. Gibson with his account of affordances. The manifest image includes lots of affordances. In fact, that's mainly what the manifest image of any species is. It's the catalog of affordances for that species. Sweet, sexy, cute, and funny, colors, solidity, causation. We are good at perceiving doors because they afford walking out of and windows because they afford looking out of and so forth. And the their utility to us, uh, their interest relativity is built right in at a very fundamental level into our, into our perceptual apparatus. That's a Gibsonian point. All of these things are in the manifest image. In almost every case, there's a projection of a property that is, in some sense, affective or a feeling. And hence, it's an action tendency. And we project it out into the world. Hume's strange inversion is that we misinterpret an inner reaction as an outer cause. We project it into the manifest world. That's what the manifest world, that's what brings the manifest world of a species into existence. It's the most natural metaphor in the world and it cannot be literal. Although some of you may be old enough to know that back in the 50s or 60s there was a strange British psychologist named J.R. Smithies who actually proposed that vision involved some kind of a projector, really, in your forehead that somehow projected the colors out onto the front leading surfaces of objects in the world. Uh, well, Aristotle had a view a little bit like that too, but Smithies should have known better, I think. Well, what does projection literally mean? It's a very nice metaphor. Well, I think we're beginning to get a handle on that. This is now venturing into speculative territory. Thanks to another brilliant Brit, Bayes, and Bayesian predictive coding. Um, if you don't know about this, there's a wonderful article coming out in BBS uh, by Andy Clark called Whatever Next, which is a wonderful introduction to the virtues and problems with the idea of Bayesian predictive coding. Every affordance yields a predictive action tendency and sets up a sort of forward model in us, which we then read backwards, more or less. That's itself not to be read literally. 
Now, when we see the front of a cup, we expect to see its back if we walk around it. We expect it to afford carrying liquid. We expect it to afford grasping and lifting. So if a hottie is sexy and a baby is cuddly, a cup is holdy. <laughs> and that's a sort of a perceptible property that we automatically endow it with because of the uh, Bayesian anticipation generators that are working in us. We're designed by evolution to perceive as many affordances as possible, at least all the ones that really matter to us. So we should have anticipations about everything that matters to us. After all, the whole point of having a brain is to allow you to expect things. It's to produce future. It's an expectation machine. And the Bayesian uh, perspective gives us some interesting new ways of thinking about how it goes about its work. Well, among the things that matter to us and that are ubiquitous in our environment is ourselves. Each of us is a permanent fixture in our, in our umwelt, in our environment, in our manifest image. So in addition to our expectations, we have expectations about our expectations. When we see a baby, we not only feel the urge to reach out and cuddle, we expect to feel that urge. Our satisfaction of that expectation confirms our perception of cuteness in the baby. The satisfied expectation of our expectations. That's what the projection is. That's what I'm suggesting. So Hume talked about the mind's great propensity to spread itself on external objects. I want to update it slightly and talk about spreading itself on internal objects. We're going to get back to the red stripe. The familiarity of an object in your perceptual field is constituted by the lack of prediction error in response to the hierarchical layers of outbound signal. Uh, and it's too late for me to try to unpack that. If you don't get that, read Andy Clark's paper and read a lot of others. Uh, this tacit confirmation is what licenses entry of a new object to be considered, thought about, talked about. This is how come we can think about, talk about that red stripe. So what about the red stripe? Thanks to Bayesian predictive coding, a representation of a red stripe is confirmed by silence, by the, by the fatigued cells that would disconfirm it if they weren't in their refractory period. But that doesn't last for long. And this can, creates a temporary real object, a notional object like Sherlock Holmes that we can think about, talk about, and that influences our behavior in many ways. Okay, I'm going to just end with a little anecdote. Anecdotes don't prove anything, but sometimes they're illuminating. Uh, uh, Ned and I have known each other for as long as Steve and I have known each other, maybe even a little longer, I don't think so, since the early 70s in any case. And one time, Ned told me that he had just had a laterality test in somebody's lab. So this was a sort of standard left brain, right brain laterality test where you stare at the little cross and a word or non-word is flashed in either the left hemifield or the right hemifield. And your task is to say whether it's a word or not as quickly as you can. And of course, they're randomly placed and so forth. And in a normal person who's strongly lateralized for language in the left hemisphere, words that appear in the right hemifield of vision will be responded to more accurately and more quickly than the ones in the left hemifield because uh, uh, the right hemisphere is just not as good at that job. Everybody's got the, it's a very standard test. I'm a lefty and I'm not very strongly lateralized for language. Ned, I said, are you, are you strongly lateralized? He said, oh yes I am, I'm, I'm, a, I'm left lateralized. And then he went on to say something really interesting. He said, you know, the words on the left appeared blurry. And I said, interesting, Ned. Which is it? You had trouble seeing the words because they were blurry? Or they appeared blurry because you noticed that you were having trouble seeing the words? Which way did the causation run? And he had to admit he had no way, no introspective way of addressing that issue. 
and I submit that it's pretty clear, although subject to further tests, that it is the latter is, uh, is the truth. It's your recognized difficulty that gives you the impression, the quale of blurriness, which doesn't have to be rendered in any medium, in any figment, or anything of the kind. You simply have the judgment. It's, ooh, they're sort of blurry. Without anything having to be put out of focus or so forth. So I think that Ned's reasoning is uninverted. Not a strange inversion, but a strange lack of inversion. He has a pre-Darwinian, pre-Humean, pre-Turingian view of the causation in the mind. He thinks that phenomenal consciousness is the causal basis of access consciousness, while in fact it is an effect of access consciousness, not a cause. In other words, what is real in the mind is, ah, oh, that's just what I expected, just what I expected to expect. It's an effect of judgment, not a cause. And hence, it's not prior to or independent of access consciousness. Thanks for your attention.